When the news broke that 77-year-old billionaire Nobu had with 22-year-old Arata, the entire nation of Japan was taken aback. The surprise turned to shock when, merely three months into their marriage, Nobu was found dead under mysterious circumstances. The investigation quickly zeroed in on his young bride, who displayed a curious lack of emotion over his demise. Despite the suspicious elements surrounding her, the absence of definitive proof made it difficult for authorities to formally charge her with the crime. Questions arose. Who exactly was Nobu? And what motives could his wife have had for allegedly orchestrating such a heinous act? The investigation not only unearthed clues, but also unveiled Nobu's controversial history with over 4,000 women. Welcome back to the channel, my name is Sunny, and today we're diving into the bizarre tale of Nobu. This story is undoubtedly among the most unusual ones I've encountered. As I've mentioned in previous episodes, Japan boasts an impressive safety record, making the instances of murder all the more jarring and complex. For those intrigued by true crime, mysterious narratives, and bone-chilling tales, you're in the right place. Hit subscribe, grab a cup of coffee, and let's get into it with the peculiar case of Nobu. Today's journey takes us to the southern reaches of Japan, to the city of Tanabe in Wakayama Prefecture. Tanabe serves not only as a historical landmark, but also as a vital hub for both land and sea transportation in the region. Despite its significance, Tanabe maintains the charm of a tranquil coastal city, home to some 65,000 residents. As we delve deeper into the enigmatic case of Nobu and his untimely demise, it becomes clear that the tranquil appearance of Tanabe City belies the complexity and darkness of this mystery. The story of Nobu, a man whose wealth and personal life had been the subject of much public fascination, takes a grim turn with his sudden death, leaving the community and the nation to grapple with a whirlwind of speculation and disbelief. Nobu, known for his extravagant lifestyle and a long history of romantic entanglements, had lived a life that many found hard to comprehend. His marriage to the much younger Arata added another layer of intrigue to his already controversial existence. The stark age difference between the couple, combined with Nobu's notorious past, set the stage for widespread speculation and rumor mongering. Yet, nothing could prepare the public for the news of his death, a puzzle that would challenge the very fabric of what was believed possible in the safe, orderly society of Japan. The investigation into Nobu's death unfolded like a labyrinth, with each clue seeming to lead only to more questions. Arata, at the center of this storm, remained an enigma. Her apparent indifference to her husband's death struck many as unnatural, perhaps a sign of guilt, yet her demeanor, in the absence of hard evidence, left law enforcement and the public alike in a state of limbo. Who was this young woman, and what connection, if any, did she have to the fate of Nobu? As authorities dug deeper, they uncovered details of Nobu's life that painted a picture of a man who was as complex as he was wealthy. His relationships with over 4,000 women were not just a testament to his lavish lifestyle, but also hinted at the complicated interpersonal dynamics that might hold the key to understanding his sudden demise. The question of motive loomed large. What could drive someone to commit such a heinous act, assuming foul play was involved? Was it jealousy, greed, revenge, or something yet unseen? As we explore the intricate details of this case, we find ourselves confronted with the darker aspects of human nature and the mysteries that lie within seemingly straightforward narratives. The case of Nobu is a reminder that behind the facade of wealth and public persona, there are layers of complexity that often go unnoticed until tragedy strikes. In our next segment, we'll dive into the investigation's findings, examine the potential motives behind Nobu's death, and explore how this case has impacted the local community and beyond. Stay tuned and remember, the truth is often stranger and more intricate than fiction. Grab your coffee and let's continue unraveling the mystery of Nobu's demise. Nestled in the southern expanse of the Key Peninsula, Tanabe is a city that harmoniously blends the natural beauty of its coastal and mountainous geography with a rich cultural heritage, particularly noted for its contributions to Japan's fishing and agriculture sectors. Known especially for its succulent oranges and uboshi, a traditional Japanese pickled plum, Tanabe has carved out a reputation for these agricultural delights. Despite its serene charm and vital economic role, Tanabe has experienced a gradual decline in population over the years, shrinking to half its size since the 1940s. It was against this backdrop of a slowly transforming Tanabe that the Nozaki family called home. Born into this changing world on April 13, 1941, 
Rime and Ozaki was the third of seven children. Life in a bustling household meant Ren often found himself lost in the shuffle, necessitating a degree of self-reliance from a young age. Despite his parents' love, Ren was known as something of a troublemaker, frequently clashing with his siblings and facing challenges at school, including bullying and poor academic performance. These difficulties led him to forgo further education in favor of contributing to the family's income by working in their local liquor store. The Nozaki family, not particularly affluent, welcomed his assistance. During these formative years, Ren developed a relentless drive for financial success, a passion that seemed to be sparked by both necessity and ambition. He was determined to do whatever it took to improve the store's profitability while simultaneously ensuring he had some personal financial independence. As time passed, the inevitable cycle of life saw Ren's parents pass away, leaving him and his siblings their inheritance. It was with this inheritance that Ren made a pivotal decision to venture into the world of entrepreneurship, leveraging the financial boost to lay the foundation for what would become a vast business empire. Ren's journey from a troublesome schoolboy to a business mogul is a testament to his unwavering focus on wealth accumulation and financial independence. His early experiences in Tanabi, from the family liquor store to his initial taste of business success, set the stage for a life that would be filled with both controversy and accomplishment. The city of Tanabi, with its declining population and tranquil lifestyle, remained an integral part of his story, a reminder of the humble beginnings from which one of its most infamous sons rose to prominence. Embarking on a business path that was morally ambiguous at best, Ren Nozaki's initial foray into the realm of entrepreneurship was not through what many would consider noble means. He became what was essentially a glorified loan shark, operating in a time when regulatory oversight on lending was virtually non-existent. During this era, the constraints that now cap interest rates at 20% to prevent predatory lending practices were absent, allowing individuals like Ren to operate with impunity. His ventures into this dark finance, or yamakin, as it's colloquially known in Japanese, a contraction of yamikinyu, meaning dark finance, epitomized the ruthless pursuit of profit at the expense of others, exploiting the financial desperation of people to build his wealth. This approach to business inevitably led to further estrangement between Ren and his siblings. Their relationship, already fraught with tension, was severely tested as Ren delved deeper into these questionable methods of wealth accumulation. His disregard for the ethical implications of his actions widened the rift within the family, casting a shadow over his character and the legitimacy of his entrepreneurial spirit. Despite the morally dubious nature of his initial success, Ren's ambition was not limited to the loan sharking business. He diversified his interests, venturing into scrap metal collection, real estate development, and even door-to-door -door condom sales. Reports from the Times suggest that these additional ventures did not turn out to be particularly profitable, hinting that the lion's share of his wealth was indeed amassed through the exploitation of debtors. However, Ren's persistence in the world of business eventually led him to real estate, where he would make the fortunes that cemented his status as a successful, albeit controversial, businessman. Adding to his notorious reputation was a conviction for tax evasion, further tarnishing his public image and cementing his persona as an entrepreneur who skirted the edges of legality and morality. Despite the dubious means through which he accumulated his wealth, Ren's financial success allowed him to indulge in a lavish lifestyle and a series of personal exploits that were as controversial as his business practices. Ren's personal life, particularly his romantic entanglements, became as much a topic of public fascination as his business dealings. With wealth came notoriety, and with notoriety came an ever-increasing number of romantic partners. It's here that Ren's life story takes yet another turn, veering into the realms of personal indulgence and excess. His pursuit of wealth was mirrored by a pursuit of pleasure, leading to a complicated and controversial personal life that would eventually intertwine with his professional endeavors in unexpected and dramatic ways. Ren Nozaki's reputation as a flamboyant and unorthodox businessman only grew with each passing year, painting a picture of a man who lived as boldly in his personal life as he did in the business world. His relationships, numbering in the thousands, were talked about with a mix of awe and disapproval, showcasing a lifestyle that many found hard to understand or accept. This aspect of his life, marked by its sheer excess, became as much a part of his identity as his wealth. As Nozaki navigated through the complexities of his business and personal life, 
his ventures into real estate began to flourish, significantly augmenting his wealth. His success in real estate seemed to provide a semblance of legitimacy to his otherwise controversial career, allowing him to establish a more respectable facade in the public eye. However, this did not mean he left his previous ventures behind. The shadow of his past as a loan shark and his conviction for tax evasion lingered, contributing to a mixed public perception that oscillated between admiration for his entrepreneurial spirit and disdain for his ethical lapses. Nozaki's wealth allowed him to indulge in a lifestyle that few could imagine, but it also isolated him in many ways. His relationships, often seen as transactions or conquests, highlighted a life filled with luxury but lacking in genuine connection. The question of whether his wealth could buy happiness lingered beneath the surface of his extravagant existence. The complexity of Ren Nozaki's character made him a subject of fascination and speculation. To some, he was a self-made success story, a man who rose from modest beginnings to achieve incredible wealth and status. To others, he was a cautionary tale of ambition run amok, a man whose ethical compromises and personal excesses led to a life of emptiness despite his financial achievements. His marriage to the much younger Arata was perhaps the most public and controversial chapter of his personal life. The age difference between them, combined with Nozaki's notorious background, fueled widespread speculation and judgment. The sudden and mysterious circumstances of his death only months after their marriage added a dark twist to his already complex narrative, transforming his life story into a true crime saga that captivated the nation. The investigation into Nozaki's death would unearth more than just the details of a mysterious demise. It would shine a light on the darker corners of his life and legacy. As authorities delved deeper, the public was left to grapple with the dichotomy of Ren Nozaki, a man whose pursuit of success knew no bounds but who, in the end, remained an enigma, a figure as captivating in death as he was in life. In this unfolding story, the lines between ambition and excess, between love and transaction, blur. Nozaki's life serves as a mirror to the complexities of human nature, challenging onlookers to ponder the true cost of wealth and the pursuit thereof. As the case progresses, it promises not only to reveal the circumstances of his untimely demise, but also to offer a reflection on the values and choices that define a life. Fascinated by women, he held the belief that sexual encounters were the central purpose of existence. In his travels from door to door selling condoms, he subtly offered additional more intimate services to women he perceived as solitary. It seemed his strategies often bear fruit. Known as a prosperous playboy, his escapades, both paid and unpaid, with numerous women were well documented. He reportedly expended over 3 billion yen, the equivalent of about 26 million USD, on interactions with over 4,000 women throughout the years. When a Japanese broadcaster inquired about his actions, he openly stated his approach to women he found attractive, promising 400,000 yen in exchange for their company. His expenditures weren't confined to personal encounters. He was also known to lavish money in nightclubs, particularly in Keishinchi, a renowned entertainment district in Osaka. His lifestyle, however, was not without consequences. His tendency to swindle both acquaintances and strangers alike led to numerous conflicts, and in 1998, he was reportedly stabbed by someone he had attempted to defraud in a loan sharking scheme. As loan sharking became less profitable, he turned his attention to his family's liquor store, which had seen growth in both size and revenue. His wealth and notoriety received a further boost in 2016 with the publication of his autobiography, Don Joan of Kishu. Released in December of that year, the book detailed his journey to affluence. Despite its focus on his financial ascent, the autobiography struggled to gain widespread popularity. However, it wasn't until his story was featured in an episode of AIM Talk, a popular TV show in Japan, that his book gained significant attention. Combined with a few interviews, this media exposure catapulted his autobiography to bestseller status, irrespective of its literary quality. At this point, Rene had amassed a fortune that allowed him almost any luxury, exotic cars, multiple properties, First-class global travel and expensive yachts were just a part of his opulent lifestyle. He was known for extravagantly attempting to win over women he found attractive by attaching free money to letters as a lure, primarily in hopes of intimate encounters. By 2017, at the age of 77, Rime had entered what many would consider his golden years, yet he showed no signs of slowing down, 
particularly in his romantic endeavors. Japan is known for its high life expectancy, a fact Rimei attributed to his own longevity, claiming in his autobiography that he avoided smoking, drugs, and stimulants despite his prolific number of sexual partners. That year marked a turning point for him. After two failed marriages, he was ready to find true love, which he did with Anna, a woman 55 years to junior. Rimei had previously been married twice, resulting in divorce each time, with no close companions except for his trusted Dakshan named Emi. He often humorously mentioned that Emi would inherit his empire should he pass away. His encounter with Aina in the autumn of 2017 was, by his account, faked. Despite the vast age difference, she was only 22, they connected almost immediately after a chance meeting, or perhaps a staged stumble, at Tokyo Han Airport. Though initially just another conquest among thousands, it quickly became much more significant to him, and they were married within months. Aina, born in 1996, was significantly younger than Rina. Originating from Sapporo on Japan's northern island, Hokkaido, she came from a relatively affluent family, which afforded her luxuries such as designer brands and high-quality foods. Rin was not driven academically and faced bullying, leading to her being quite reserved during her school years. However, in her mid-teens, her personality began to change as she started to indulge in expensive fashion and beauty, supported financially by her parents. This newfound interest in aesthetics and wealth led her to pursue a career in beauty and makeup. To supplement her income, she allegedly also engaged in sex work and appeared in adult films, underscoring a complex narrative intertwined with themes of ambition, desire, and the search for love amidst unconventional circumstances. Saki's move to Tokyo, ostensibly to pursue her career as a beautician, was shadowed by her infatuation with a host from a bar in Sapporo. She had been lavishing him with attention and money, up to 150,000 yen, around $1,000 for his company. When he decided to relocate to Tokyo, she didn't hesitate to follow. However, their relationship, built on financial transactions rather than emotional connection, soon disintegrated. By then, Saki had set her sights on a new, more lucrative target, Rin Nobu, the so-called Don Juan of Kishu. Their meeting at an airport led to a whirlwind romance, culminating in marriage just a few months later. Rene, perhaps eager to ensure his young bride's happiness and loyalty, offered her a contract absolving her of any traditional domestic duties and providing her with a generous monthly allowance of one million yen. It seemed Ren was content to spend his twilight years in comfort and companionship with Saki, away from his notorious past. The couple, often seen with Ren's beloved dog, Emi, enjoyed a seemingly idyllic life filled with leisurely walks, shopping trips in Ren's Mercedes, and dinners at upscale restaurants. This peaceful existence suggested that Rime had finally found a semblance of domestic bliss. However, this tranquil period was short-lived. Merely three months into their marriage, Rime's life came to an abrupt end. But the seeds of this tragic conclusion were sown 18 days earlier with another sorrowful Emi, the death of his cherished dog, Emi. On May 6, 2018, Rime was awakened by Emi's distressing yelps. The dog was suffering from uncontrollable fits and severe pain. Despite Rene's readiness to seek veterinary help, Ima passed away in his arms within minutes, leaving him heartbroken. Emi had been more than a pet. She was his constant companion and source of unconditional love for over a decade. The loss left Rene enveloped in grief, a profound sadness that was compounded by the loony tragedy of his own demise. In his mourning, Rene arranged for a monk to conduct a ceremony for Emi a final farewell to his loyal friend, unaware of the fate that awaited him. The circumstances surrounding Emi's sudden demise were undeniably peculiar. Despite her advanced age, she had been in excellent health, showing no signs of illness or ailments. Her unexpected passing left Reen utterly bewildered. However, his bewilderment would soon be overshadowed by his own tragic fate. On the fateful Emi morning of May 24, just 18 days after Emi's demise, Rime himself was discovered deceased. He was found nearly nude, slumped over on his bedroom couch in a disturbing posture. An autopsy revealed an alarmingly high concentration of stimulants in his system, a dosage far beyond what would be considered lethal. The cause of death was determined to be acute stimulant poisoning, resulting from the ingestion of a massive quantity of stimulants in one instance. 
This revelation presented a perplexing contradiction to those familiar with Rene's public persona. In his writings and public statements, he adamantly voiced his opposition to drugs and stimulants. Moreover, analysis of his hair indicated no long-term drug use. Furthermore, there were no signs of injection marks on his body, suggesting that the stimulant was consumed orally. This discrepancy led investigators to consider the possibility that both Reen's and perhaps even Emi's deaths were not merely tragic accidents but deliberate acts of foul play. The sudden shift in focus transformed Rina's residence into a scene of intense scrutiny by detectives, eager to unravel the mystery behind the deaths haunting the once tranquil abode. Surveillance footage revealed that in the hours leading up to Rene's death, only two individuals entered his property, his wife and his cleaner. The cleaner had spent most of the day with Rene, assisting him in arranging a funeral for Emi, his beloved dog. Around 4 o'clock p.m., the cleaner left briefly to run errands and returned around 6.30 p.m. Meanwhile, Saki remained downstairs while Rene went upstairs to make phone calls. Later that evening, they heard thumping noises from upstairs, prompting the cleaner to ask Saki to check on him. However, she seemed unconcerned, and it wasn't until 10 o'clock p.m. that the cleaner once again urged her to investigate. It was then that they discovered Reen's lifeless body in his bedroom. Given the circumstances, it seemed unlikely that Rene had intended to take his own life. The burning question remained, who had administered the lethal dose of stimulants? The only two individuals with access to Reen and the opportunity to administer the stimulants were his wife and his cleaner. However, the cleaner, who had been with Reen for over a decade, had no apparent motive or benefit to harm him. Thus, suspicion fell squarely on Saki, his 22-year-old wife of only three months. Some speculated that Saki may have been a gold digger, marrying Reen for financial gain. With Reen's vast wealth, estimated at 5 billion yen, approximately $33 million USD, she stood to inherit a substantial fortune upon his death. Moreover, her demeanor following Rina's passing, reportedly emotionless and preoccupied with her smartphone, even his funeral, raised eyebrows. Despite mounting suspicion, investigators lacked concrete evidence to charge Saki with murder. Attempts to find toxic substances in Emi's body proved inconclusive due to the advanced state of decomposition. Nevertheless, detectives were determined to pursue justice. In May 2021, three years after Reen's and Emi's deaths, Saki was arrested on suspicion of murder. With only a 30-day window to detain a suspect under Japanese law, authorities faced a race against time. Over the following weeks, evidence emerged implicating Saki further. Her phone data contradicted her claims about her movements on the day of Reen's death. Additionally, her internet search history revealed inquiries about drugs and stimulants shortly before Emi's demise. Forensic analysis uncovered traces of narcotics in the kitchen and vacuum cleaner, while her phone records indicated communication with a known drug dealer. These damning revelations painted a troubling picture, casting serious doubt on Saki's innocence and leaving investigators determined to uncover the truth behind the deaths that had shrouded Rina's once peaceful abode. The technological evidence further solidified suspicions against Saki, confirming that both she and Rina were indeed in the same location at the time of his death. Reports surfaced suggesting that Rene had contemplated divorce in the weeks leading up to his demise due to Saki's reluctance to live with him in his tab residence. Meanwhile, Rene had already found a new partner, adding to the strain in their relationship. The situation worsened when, just two months after Rene's death, Saki convened a shareholders meeting at their residence, attending it alone. During the meeting, she appointed herself as president of the company and awarded herself an exorbitant annual salary of $1.5 million, along with a personal bonus of $400,000. Investigators, upon apprehending her in Tokyo, uncovered her plans to flee to Dubai with the substantial funds she had amassed. With this damning evidence at their disposal, Aina was formally charged with the murder of Rin Nobu. However, despite her arrest nearly three years ago, she awaits trial and progress on the case has been notably slow. Concerns arise as there have been no updates on her current whereabouts, leading to speculation that she may have been discreetly released. Proving Saki's guilt presents a formidable challenge for authorities, especially considering the difficulty in substantiating poison-related offenses, particularly after such a considerable amount of time has passed. Despite the mounting evidence against her, Saki adamantly maintains her innocence, professing her love for Reen.
friends of Rene corroborate his intention to divorce Saki, with one revealing that he had been asked to be present during the confrontation. This detail fuels speculation that Saki may have learned of the impending divorce and impulsively resorted to murder to secure her inheritance. As the legal proceedings linger, uncertainty looms over the fate of Rene's estate, which remains frozen. The tragic deaths of both Rene and Emi cast a somber shadow over the unresolved case. While Saki is entitled to the presumption of innocence until proven guilty, suspicions surrounding her persist, with many attributing to her the unsettling aura of a potential gold-digging murderer. Ultimately, the truth behind Rene's untimely demise remains shrouded in uncertainty, leaving lingering questions and a sense of injustice. As the investigation unfolds, only time will reveal the full extent of Saki's involvement and whether justice will prevail for the victims and their loved ones.